In the past lecture, we looked at the gospel in the man who was Thursday and this explanation for uh, suffering, the, the answer to the problem of suffering that Christianity gives in the fact that we can repel the lie of Satan and that Christ has not asked us to do anything that he himself has not done. Now, one of the challenges that that raises for us is the fact that we see in the final chapter that Sunday is the Sabbath, the peace of God. And we see that Sunday then takes on this uh, Christ-like persona, can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? And so uh, that forces us into a, a bit of a dilemma because we're trying to explain then uh, what in the world we do with Sunday, who uh, for so long... Uh, seem to be the evil character in the story. And this is what each of these um, particular characters are struggling with. Um, because they're saying, if you were at once our greatest friend, why were you at the same time our greatest enemy? Uh, how do we explain all of this? Well, I think that what we find is that there's a pretty interesting perspective uh, that Syme stumbles upon as each of these people begin to try to explain Sunday. And we see this on 142. After several pages of these anarchist council members speaking, uh, Syme says, Have you noticed an odd thing, he said, about all your descriptions? Each man of you finds Sunday quite different, yet each man of you can only find one thing to compare him to, the universe itself. Bull finds him like the earth in spring, Gogol like the sun at noonday, the secretary is reminded of the shapeless protoplasm, and the inspector of the carelessness of virgin forests. The professor says he is like a changing landscape. This is queer, but it is queer still that I have also had my odd notion about the president, and I also find that I think of Sunday as I think of the world. Get on a little faster, Syme, said Bull. Never mind the balloon. When I first saw Sunday, said Syme slowly, I only saw his back. And when I saw his back, I knew he was the worst man in the world. His neck and shoulders were brutal, like those of some apish god. His head had stood, had a stoop that was hardly human, like the stoop of an ox. In fact, I had at once the revolting fancy that this was not a man at all, but a beast dressed up in men's clothes. Get on, said Dr. Bull. And then the queer thing happened. I had seen his back from the street, as he sat in the balcony. Then I entered the hotel, and coming around the other side of him, saw his face in the sunlight. His face frightened me, as it did everyone, but not because it was brutal, not because it was evil. On the contrary, it frightened me because it was so beautiful, because it was so good. And Simon goes on in arguing with uh, the other members here uh, about his perception of the president, and on the bottom of page 143, he says, Listen to me, cried Syme, with extraordinary emphasis. Shall I tell you the secret of the whole world? It is that we have only known the back of the world. We see everything from behind, and it looks brutal. That is not a tree, but the back of a tree. That is not a cloud, but the back of a cloud. Cannot you see that everything is stooping and hiding a face? If we could only get round in front, and at this point, he's interrupted. And he's interrupted here, but I want to kind of guess at what I think Syme is beginning to understand. And here's what I think Syme is beginning to understand, is he sees a connection between God and nature. He, he sees what Scripture tells us all over the place. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night after night reveals knowledge, is what Psalm 19 tells us. Uh, there's something about creation that reflects the glory and the character of God. In, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says that what was known about God can be is plain to them because it's been revealed in the things that have been created, that God's creation reflects who he is, his character, his nature, his existence. But the problem is that when that world is corrupted by sin, when we see the effects of sin on the natural world, what we begin to find is that the natural world seems brutal, merciless, 
um, unkind, uh, almost aggressively evil in some cases when we think about earthquakes or tornadoes or hurricanes or tsunamis. We just think about the massive power of the natural world and it seems evil. Sure, yeah, we can see the beauty of a sunrise. We can see the, the beauty of uh, a trickling waterfall, uh, a stream of the, the colorful leaves blowing in the tree. We can see that beauty, but we're so often confronted by the massive and powerful uh, problems and, and seeming evil, natural evil that comes about in the natural world. And what Simon has stumbled upon here is the realization that nature is meant to be a reflection of God, but it is a poor reflection because of human sinfulness and the corruption then of all of creation. And so as they go throughout the book in The Man Who Was Thursday, Sunday plays this fascinating conglomeration of characters. And on the one hand, he seems to have this this cold, unfeeling, um, uh, impersonal evil of like natural disaster. But on the other hand, when Syme comes around and sees him from the front, there's a there's an almost unnatural or supernatural beauty and goodness to him that he can't explain. He's almost too big to be believed, and yet somehow he can just be believed. And despite his desperate fear of Sunday, he sees the beauty and the goodness in him. And Syme says, here's the idea. The secret of the universe is that we've only seen the back of the world. That's not a tree, it's just the back of a tree. He says, if we could only get round in front, and I think what Syme is saying, if we could get around to the front and see the front of that tree and not the back, we would see an incalculable, beautiful picture, an indescribable beauty from the other side. There's a poem by George Herbert called The Elixir. And he talks about uh, the idea of looking into a mirror. And he says something to the effect of, uh, when man may look on glass, um, and there he rest his eye, or if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then the world espy. And, and I think what, what Herbert has stumbled upon is maybe the, the even more clear answer than Syme does is that we don't just want to go around to see the front. It's actually that we go through. We go through the mirror, kind of like uh, Alice through the looking glass. That we go through the mirror of the world and we turn around to see the other side. Uh, what we're seeing right now is a reflection of the brokenness of the natural world on account of human sinfulness. But on the other side of that brokenness is the smiling face of God. There's a, a beautiful hymn by William Cooper, um, and, and he talks about that. He says, Behind a, fa a frowning providence, he hides his smiling face. Um, he says, God moves in a mysterious way. That's the, the name of the hymn. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, Fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are rich with mercy and will break with blessings on your head. He's talking about the storms of life, the trials that come. And he says, just wait, they're truly blessings in the end. And as he gets to that, that other stanza, and he says those beautiful lines behind a frowning providence. As God is sovereign and providential over all of his creation, it seems as though God is frowning. It seems as though things are chaotic and evil. But behind all that, God hides his smiling face. And our challenge is not merely to see the back of the world, not even like Syme says, to get around to the front of the world, but I think to pass through the mirror to be able to look at the world the way that God sees it. And here's what I think is so beautiful, is that Scripture gives us that same kind of perspective. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Christ is this veil, and that we see him passing through the heavens, 
and Christ is the, the mediator and the link between heaven and earth so that our earthly perspective and God's heavenly perspective are united in the perspective of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so as we pass through the mirror, what we're actually called to do in Scripture is to pass through the veil, which is Christ, into the heavenly places, to sit at, at the in the presence of the Father, right? Who, whom God is now, we have access to him in Christ through the Spirit, as Ephesians 2 says. So we now have access to the Father to be in his presence and to see the world as he sees it through the perspective of Christ. And so this beautiful portrait that's painted I think Syme is stumbling upon that idea and Chesterton is is leading us to the reality that Sunday, all the while he seems like cold, in, uh, human, impersonal, uh, brutal nature. In fact, behind that hides his smiling face, hides the beauty of the world as it actually is. And so if we can learn to pass through the veil, which is Christ, and to see the world as God sees it, and to see the world as God will one day make it again. That is our hope, that the creation that God has created for us to dwell in will one day be fully renewed. And those those trials, those sufferings, the, the danger, the fear that come along with the just sheer power of the natural world will no longer uh, be fears for us. God will wipe away every tear from our eye and there will be no no hunger or pain or crying anymore for those things have passed away. Because God says, Behold, I am making all things new. And the dwelling place of God will be with man. And so the hope of Revelation 21 is this new creation um, that God has restored. And so what we are called to do in the present is to see behind all the trials of this world what seems the frowning providence of a, an impersonal, a brutal nature is in fact the smiling face of God if we can only see the world as God sees it and will one day make it to be again.